James is going to be talking about something very interesting, uh, or he's going to talk about his book, The Billionaire Raj. And of course, you, all of you know James. James has just been a great author, prolific writer, was part of the FT team, worked in the Kwan Yu School for Policy, et cetera, et cetera. But I think an exceptional human being, most of all. But Thank James, you. over to you for your 18-minute talk, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you to the organizers. Thank you for having me here. Um, yesterday, when we were on the panel, you, you saw me okay. in my more recent avatar talking about security and geopolitics. But I lived in India from 2011 to 2016. And my specialist subject was the, the Indian hyper elite, the, the billionaire class. Um, and, and I did something that, in a sense, was a little bit risky. So the, 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 the bookshelves of bookshops heave with books written by white British journalists who decide to write books about India. And I was a bit circumspect about adding to the, the heaving pile um, of books about India. But I suppose the longer that I lived in, in Mumbai, uh, the more I realized that I had been quite fortunate not because of my charm and good looks, but mostly because of the newspaper that I worked for, that I had got an unusual amount of access to the business titans who had an exceptional influence on the Indian economy. One of the nice things about working in India is India is very open. I've since moved further east in Asia, and you realize that in China or Japan or Korea, you know, your odds of meeting and getting to know a captain of industry are almost zero. But in India, I, you know, I was lucky enough um, by, to meet almost all of the, the heads of the major industrial houses in one form or another. And some of them I got to know really quite well. And the result of this was, um, if I can shift this forward, one, th this book, the, the Billionaire Raj, which came out five years ago. And so the, the organizers asked me here to sort of the difficult question when you've written a book, which is, did you get it right or did you get it wrong? As in, how well does this thing stack up five years later? One of the criticisms that I got when writing the book uh, was, you know, you wrote a book about Indian business, and in that book you'll find almost no mention of the kind of business culture that Gucharan Das and others here represent, the, the Tatars and Mahindras, the, the sort of the good guys, as it were, the, 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 the IT, uh, um, no, um, you know, pe people like the IT giants, I, I focused entirely on the industrial conglomerates, those who were either accused of or associated with a certain type of business activity. And so you can see this is the, uh, the opening triptych here. So the first three chapters of the book, uh, there was a chapter on Mukesh Ambani and the history of reliance. There was a chapter on, on Vijay Malia. And there was a chapter uh, on a gentleman called Gautam Adani, and I had to have a fight with my publisher at the time who said, nobody's interested in Gautam Adani. No one's heard of this guy. Why do you want to put him in the book? Like, we understand Mukesh Ambani, richest man in India, Vijay Malia, you know, terrific character. But this guy, like, who's he? Well, let's get rid of him. We don't want that. And I had to sort of fight a rearguard action. And so the book has actually had a little bit, there's been renewed interest five years on in this book, partly because of um, the short-selling episode with Adani, partly because of the election and partly just because India is so attractive at the moment for reasons that Sanjeev Sanyal and others have, have well explained that, in a sense, foreign investors have renewed their interest uh, in India. So what, what was the sort of the core of the book? I mean, there were bits of the book that got picked up in the media. Uh, this was one of them. Uh, this was a, a picture of a golden toilet that uh, Vijay Malia had in his house in London. So when I, when I went to interview him, I actually got to use the, the golden toilet. One of my main journalistic rules was wherever you go, when it, whoever you're interviewing, whether it's the Pentagon or the White House or 10 Downing Street, always use the bathroom because you learn something interesting about an institution from the thing that they keep behind closed doors. And so at some point in a four-hour conversation with Vijay Malia, I ex he was drinking whiskey, I don't drink, uh, but I still needed to go to the bathroom and I excused myself and discovered that in his mansion in London he had a golden toilet. Uh, and this became the thing uh, in the book that people uh, uh, kind of picked up on. 
Uh, the book was actually picked up slightly more widely. It was read by the, uh, the political class. So you, was, you can see even, even in Uttar Pradesh, the billionaire Raj was, was sort of widely, widely viewed uh, uh, by you know, Im important uh, uh, examples of good Indian governance. Um, really, I think people were interested uh, in the, the glamour of the first chapter. So uh, um, Antilio, which I think Sanjeev mentioned this yesterday, that in Mumbai, until all of the new infrastructure, Mumbai was this remarkable metropolis with 20 million people and one road, which went from north to south in the city. And two, OK, really only one, right? There was the one that you, you took that went up the west side of the city. And I used to take that every day. So every day, I'd go past Antilia. Um, and such was the influence of Mukesh Ambani that I even remember seeing this, that, that, that Antilia had begun to uh, influence the architectural choices of, uh, of Gujarat's more, uh, more Jugad style of, uh, of housing. Um, but really, to be serious about it, the, the story of the billionaire Raj, I mean, I'm, I'm a journalist and storyteller, and I love the characters of India. But I was trying to write a book about Indian political economy and the era in which India, after a long period of semi-autarky, had re-engaged with globalization. You can see the basic figures here, that India's economy is much for all of the reputation that it has of being a country that isn't terribly open to trade and is difficult. And you know, it's much, much more open than the United States, for instance, to uh, global trade uh, and investment. And the change has been absolutely dramatic. And so some of the things that I wrote about were kind of the growing pains of that period, that, that India had gone from an economy that genuinely was closed to one that was quite open, more open than the United States, more open in some respects than China. And that onrush of capital and engagement created problems as well as opportunities. And I focused on, on some of those problems. And I wanted to just focus on a few of those, the big arguments in the book, and say what I think I got right and one of the things I got wrong. Uh, one of the things I got wrong was Narendra Modi, as in in the, the chapters on Modi, um, I went to, I did what you know, a good journalist would do. I went to Gujarat, I went to where he grew up, I met his teacher, I interviewed his brother, I stood on the train platform where you know, he has the Chayawala. So I sort of tried to understand his life, his time as a Pracharak, his history. But even having done that, I didn't have any sense of, of the, the sort of the transformational leader that he would become. I mean, I think I, in common with the conventional wisdom at the time, thought that the normal political gravity uh, of India would take effect. And it was an almost article of faith in the pre-Modi years that the idea of having a majority government in India was a sociological impossibility, that this was a country that was destined to have sort of awkward coalitions forever. And the idea that someone like Modi could win two and then probably three thumping majorities was almost inconceivable. So I didn't see that coming. So that's just to, to sort of say, you know, what, what did I get wrong, as it were? I, I, didn't, I don't think I understood that properly. Um, the, one of the core bits of the book, and Sanjeev mentioned this uh, the other day, that it was I, I was interested in the billionaire class um, and the fact that it had grown spectacularly from almost nothing to a situation in which India has um, more billionaires than any country uh, in the world other than the United States uh, and China. It's sort of overtaken Russia. And you can sort of argue the toss about that. Sanjeev said in his opening remarks that you know, having more billionaires is good. You know, India should have an appropriate number of billionaires for a country of its size. But I was using this as a proxy for a wider debate about the, the risks of inequality. And so, to be clear, I used to work for Tony Blair. I used to work for the Financial Times. I'm not a kind of hard Marxist, if you see what I mean. I'm perfectly comfortable with a certain level of inequality. But the, the, the argument that I was trying to make is that the, 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 the sort of the concentration of wealth at the very pinnacle of Indian society was an indicator of a broader trend. Um, so here you have the, 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 two, the two biggies uh, who we can talk about if you're, you're interested and their, their current net worth. But this was indicative of a wider trend in which in the period of economic growth, India had become much more unequal. And the argument that I would hear in groups like this was, you know, that's okay. The rising tide is lifting all boats. People at the top are doing this well, but people at the bottom are still doing well. And I suppose I had gone to have a look at some literature which suggested that countries that have very, very wide levels of inequality, you think of the Latin American countries, South Africa, the challenge is that once you hit that level of inequality, it, it creates problems. It makes it more difficult to 
um, enact social and economic reforms, for instance, because it's more difficult to bring together a, a coalition uh, when you have very sharp social divisions. It's also, to some degree, the IMF say, associated with financial instability. So there are, and the, the big thing is that once you hit that level of inequality, it's quite difficult to put the toothpaste back in the tube. As in, you might think, okay, we're going through this raucous period of gilded age growth now, but then, you know, we will develop a welfare state and we'll sort of get it back under control later. And that doesn't seem to be the pattern. Once you start out as unequal as South Africa or Brazil, you, you stay there. And I suppose the evidence that I can see is that so far, at least, that story of the very sharp increase in inequality in India uh, remains. And I think that it is... I think it is a problem that people within the current government are grappling with and are trying to deal with, but I think it remains, it, isn't, it shouldn't just be a concern of the left. Business leaders and people who are supportive of this government should also see it as an objective to sort of bring the levels of inequality in India down to more manageable levels. Now, we're not talking about Denmark here. If you look at Singapore or, I mean, Japan and Korea are slightly different because they have unusual levels of social inequality and social cohesion. But if you look at other successful economies that have moved in Asia from, uh, uh, from sort of poverty levels to middle income and beyond, they don't tend to have levels of inequality as high uh, as India does at the moment. So that was one issue that I, that I looked at. The second one was corruption. I mean, the major theme uh, in the book was crony capitalism. And I suppose, to be fair to uh, Mr. Kant and others who represent this government, really this was a book about the UPA era. As a friend of mine uh, put it recently, this was an era where every cabinet minister was a sovereign state um, in, and in which you, know, you, you, you had a lot of, um, a, a kind of corruption scandals that were fundamentally linked to sort of free-ranging free, free cabinet ministers and their friends in the corporate elite. And I suppose my sense is uh, that, that that has improved a good deal under this government and that there has also been, particularly in areas where there has been digitization, that there has been uh, improvement in the level of, of sort of everyday corruption. Nonetheless, this remains a, a work in progress. And if you look at uh, the, the countries who have over time brought corruption down to manageable levels, it's a different stage with every level of development. So I'm not just thinking about Singapore, but countries like Malaysia, for instance, the, the crony capitalism that you have to deal with at $1,500 per capita is different from the crony capitalism you have to deal with at $4,500 per capita. And so while I see some improvements uh, uh, over the course of the two Modi terms, I think it, it is an area where there has to be a sort of continue and on, continuing and ongoing effort to make sure that that that's the sort of the path that, that the country uh, is on. I suppose, however, the, the main point of doing this was to say, uh, in the era of the season of scams at the end of the UPA government, I would talk to friends in India who were very self-lacerating about the problems of corruption, as if this was a sort of uniquely Indian phenomenon, that somehow there was something wrong with the Indian character that had led to you know, people to sell off mobile phone uh, licenses or iron ore. And I suppose the point of the Billionaire Raj was to try and locate India's experience within a much wider range of examples in which every country um, that has moved from poverty through middle income to rich status has gone through a period of crony capitalism. You know, we, we live, uh, we're standing here on land bought by Leland Stanford, who was, you know, a tycoon and a crony capitalist in his own way. The American Gilded Age, the reason why I used this I called it India's Gilded Age, but the reason for that wasn't just to have a shortcut of talking to American uh, readers, although that was helpful. It was to say that you know, Britain in the 1820s, America in the 1870s and 1880s, Korea in the 1970s, all of these countries have been through a period in which they had this kind of spectacular corruption and collusion between the business and the political elite. And so India is going through that too. I mean, it, it should be expected in a funny way. It's a feature, not a bug of development. And the question really is how and in what way do you, do you move through this, with what pace and what sort of institutional legacy? And I feel like India is on that journey, but it's something that you have to continue to work at. It's not something that you solve once by stopping the kind of corruption that happened under UPA. It's something you have to, com you have to continue uh, to look at. A third area that I looked at was the link between a crony capitalism and the political system, um, which, which I think is an area where perhaps the, the challenge remains, as in 
you know, it's perfectly, I think India now on most estimates, although it's very hard to, uh, to find reliable data on this, is a more expensive democracy even than the United States. I mean, the, the, the data on this is obviously extremely difficult to work out because nobody really knows what an Indian election campaign costs beyond a very few people who aren't going to tell you. But you see estimates of five, seven billion dollars, and, and that is gradually overtaking the, uh, the cost of the United States. You know, who knows how much this one will cost. Despite the, you know, the, the mechanisms that have been introduced, the electoral bonds and so forth that now cancelled, we, we know that all, mo, all, the vast majority of this is happening illegally, and it's very difficult for voters in India to understand what, if any, quid pro quos come from this and how it works. It was something that I was endlessly fascinated by, and it seems to me that this also remains a challenge for India's democracy, that while the democracy works very well in certain respects, a situation in which you had a more American model, in which it's a very expensive democracy, but one that has more transparency, would be an improvement on improvement for voters, for, for people who are trying to understand the relationship between business and government than there is now. And that seems to be an area in which there hasn't been as much progress, perhaps, um, as, I, as I suspect the average Indian voter um, might have liked. And still, I put this on Twitter the other day as a sort of contemporary moment, uh, still you see that maybe there are the, the occasional rumblings of, uh, of discontent up uh, in the, the high level between the, the political elite uh, and, and the business elite. I, I suppose the sort of the conclusion of this is the point that I just made, that the have, things have got better, is my assessment, having you know, continued to go to India. But the process of moving beyond this period of development, your sort of gilded age period, is a difficult one. And every country has to do it in their own way. Um, often this has happened, it is different in India's case. India was a democracy throughout this period. Often what has happened, let's take Korea as an example, is you start out as an autocracy. And when you have a, an autocrat in power, the autocrat has these very close relationships with certain industrial houses, and they use that to try and industrialize their country. And then many of these countries have gradually become more democratic. And that process of accountability has also helped to drive sort of corruption and the inefficiency of cronyism out of the system. India's path is different, and India's moment in history is different. Uh, India, as opposed to China, is having to make its way in the world without the following wind of a period of hyper-globalization. It's having to do it in the face of the challenges of the climate crisis, and it's having to do it as a democracy, which many of these other countries were not. The United States was uh, of a sort, albeit not one uh, where women were allowed to vote, but it was a democracy in the latter half of the, 20th, of the 19th century when it was going through this period. I think all I would say to conclude is that the risk is that sort of countries feel that this is a battle that has been won, as in, this was a problem that existed at the time when our political opponents were in power, and we have now come into power, and we've fixed most of this, and therefore we don't need to think about it anymore. And I suppose my sense as an observer and a friend of India, and someone who's looked at many other countries who've been through this process, is this is a battle that is ongoing, just as the battle to ensure that your children have a good education, or the elderly have good health care, or your government is becoming more efficient, or your state has more capacity, your foreign service has more influence. You have to continue to try uh, and move beyond, step by step, the kind of problems that India went through uh, in the last decade and is moving beyond in this. So thank you very much.